welcome. Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. <coughs> I want to wish everybody um, Happy New Year, January 1st, January 2nd, 2012. Um, <coughs> a little dressed up today. We just came, recently came back from being sworn in as um, a new city councilor at, at Lodge. Um, <coughs> so we'll be your city councilor for the next two years. Some people say congratulations. You know, sometimes you wonder. What did I get myself into? <clears throat> but it's still an, always an honor and a privilege to um, serve the people of Keene. And I'm always grateful of the confidence they give place in me by giving me um, their vote. And so <clears throat> I want to congratulate Kendall Lane. He was sworn in as a, a new mayor. And so as we get forward looking into 2012, there's going to be a, <clears throat> a lot of issues coming up into that's going to affect Keene. We've got the um, <clears throat> Keene School Board this Saturday. We'll be spending all day going over the um, bud proposed budget for the upcoming um, year. School e it's going to be a tough one. We don't know um, <clears throat> really how much money the, um, the state could possibly cut. Um, there's a number of, um, there'll be a number of attempts to get constitutional amendments on the ballot which would basically all intent and purposes say that the state of New Hampshire is not responsible for educating its children, that the education of the children should be left alone, left to the local community. The local community should determine um, what they should teach and how much they should spend on education. Really basically kind of cause the ultimate separate but not equal. Your quality of education would be depending on where you were born and the wealth of that community. And so <clears throat> the, the second part we budget coming up is we've got the county budget coming up. And one of the big things on the county budget is the doing away with the alternative sentence program. Um, <clears throat> we're told we got to cut, we got to cut. And one of the problems that about doing away with the alternative um, sentence program, I think right now it costs about 106. They rounded off about $110 a day to keep someone in jail. The alternative um, drug, um, alternative release program is about $40 a day. But we can easily say, well, you know what, we're going to save $80 a day by not putting someone in, in jail. Well, we're not talking about violent criminals. We're talking sometimes people doing stupid things. And when you throw someone in jail, it's extremely rare when it's only one person. And so if, for example, I did something stupid and I had to spend six months at the county corrections, <clears throat> so 180 days at $100, so very easily cost the taxpayers eighteen to $20,000. But what happens if I'm married and I've got two kids and... I'm the only worker. I go to jail, plain and simple, no money comes in, my wife can't pay the rent, can't feed the kids, then they have to go down to Keene, the local um, services, and ask for, for rent subsidies, ask for money to pay for the children, and so where if I was given an alternative sentence, where I still go to work every single day, I still pay... Um, bring money home, I feed my kids, I pay the rent, and everything goes, but I'm still being punished. And if I need medical help or I need psychological care, um, that's taken care of. And so sometimes we, we're so worried about throwing people into jail out of fear that we're not looking at, at the long-term picture. To me, a couple of young children so what if daddy has a bracelet on his ankle? Or so what if daddy has to go and see the, <clears throat> the, the therapist at the end of the day after work to help dad get better? You know what? It's better than going to school and saying, my daddy can't show up because my daddy or my mom is in jail. No, that has a negative effect on, on the child too. We as a society, yes, we got to put our most dangerous criminals in jail. We have to put the people who may not be dangerous, but 
they're going to keep repeating crime after crime after crime. They have to, they need to go to jail until they, they learn their lesson. But the part is what we need to do is, is our goal as a community to fill up the empty beds in jail or is our goal in community to take everybody that's salvageable and remoldable and get them back on the right track so they're becoming law-abiding, productive citizens in our community. So instead of taking community services, they help funding other community services. That's a big issue that's going to be coming up on the, um, <clears throat> the county side. The city, the city's going to have issues um, also. Um, yes, Keene is, is a really good city. Keene has been going, is doing a heck of a lot better than most of the communities in the, um, in the country. Uh, my finances are looking good, but everything's getting pretty tight. And I don't have to tell people who've got their tax bills that it is tight. The money just isn't there. And if I go around and I, I look at Keene, I look at the J.C. Penny Plaza, there's two or three empty places. Another one um, is going out of business. The, um, the woman's store right next to um, the video store is going out of business. Sears is going out of business in the Sears at Old Kmart Plaza. There's one or two empty um, places there. If I go down to Monadnock, I see Circus City <clears throat> place is still empty after years. Borders is empty. We go to the CVS Plaza. Um, Synergy is moving downtown. They'll have another empty place there across the street. <clears throat> There's a, a few empty places there. And as we go around the, the town, there are a lot of businesses that have empty, that are empty. They're not bringing income into the city. They're not providing jobs for people in the city. So there's a lot of warning signs <clears throat> that are there that the city of Keene is going to have to find a way <clears throat> is how do we entice businesses to come in, fill those vacant spaces, pay their property taxes, give jobs to people to work in Keene. Otherwise, <clears throat> We can't be blind to that fact. We can't keep saying we're doing better than everyone else or we're doing better than most. Sometimes you've got to sit down and say, is, are we doing as good as we are capable of doing? Let's not compare ourselves to the other people. Let's not compare ourselves and say we're less worse off. We need to look at ourselves and say, yes, let's look at our current situation and what can we do to make our current situation better than it is right now? Otherwise, it's just going to get worse. And anybody, a lot of businesses, a lot of realtors know, as you go around a community and you see more and more empty spaces, and I wasn't even counting the center at Keene, <clears throat> prospective businesses go, well, you know what? I don't think so. I need to look someplace else. And so we as a city <clears throat> have to do something. <clears throat> The other part, the big elephant in the room, or ba basically the big elephant that's tromping down everything, the elephant that's causing, for example, the, <clears throat> the, the county government additional expenses by reducing costs to cover Medicaid um, expenses, the, the state house. We put $35 million in the budget where we knew there was a possibility that we couldn't win the lawsuit we lost the lawsuit, so that's $35 million that we have to come up with. We went and cut cigarette taxes because <clears throat> we were told that the people from Massachusetts would drive up to New Hampshire and buy more cigarettes because a cigarette cotton would be a dollar a cotton less. And it's like, <clears throat> and what happened? We're losing millions. I think the last one was a little bit more than $3 million in one month. Another one was about $4 million of money that we have lost. And so if we continue losing that money, it means we have to cut services. If we have $4 million less in cigarette taxes, that money was spent, <clears throat> was counted on to fund something else. So that means for one month of a real ill-advised tax cut, we, the city of people of New Hampshire, have to go without $4 million 
with the services. <coughs> so if it's, for example, just let's be nice, $3 million a month, tw 24 months. So you can be looking at is over the cost, we're already eight, we got six months in, we got 18 months left. So over the next 18 months, if we don't do anything about the cigarette tax and it continues, we're going to cut seven, we we're going to have to cut $72 million worth of services from our budget to cover the loss because constitutionally we have to balance the budget. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, Tea Party or whatever, fiscally conservative. <clears throat> yes, there are places that you have to um, cut in the budget because we just don't have money, but that's not the way government works. What government, how government really works is if you don't have the money, you get screwed. Because if you can afford someone with orange badges to come up to the state house and you can talk over and over, you track down the rep in the hallway, you track down the rep in the men's room, I assume they do it in the women's room too, and say, hey, this is a bad bill. I want you to do this. Can you do this for me? Plain and simple. <clears throat> and that's how a lot of the laws get passed. That's how a lot of these cuts are implemented. Well, if you're developing disabled, um, you have an elderly who's suffering from elderly abuse, or your elderly who's being um, ripped off from fraud, you don't have someone that's going to come up with an orange badge and say, hey, um, Representative Roberts, can you help me here? Or can you help me there? That doesn't happen. Or little kids who have been abused, or little kids who are in foster homes, or little kids who need mental health care, they're not going to have advocates there. They're not going to be going and saying, please, can you help me, mister? You know, it's almost kind of like Charles Dickens, you know, please, mister, please, mister, can you help me? And what we do up at the State House, unfortunately, we don't look down. So you have a little kid who's asking for help. We don't look down. It's kind of like when you're going through a crosswalk and that person goes right after you and they, and they go, oh, and they look the other way as if you, they didn't see you. You know what? We up at the State House, if we don't look down, it doesn't make the kid who needs help go away. It just doesn't happen. <clears throat> and like I said before, you need to hold us accountable <clears throat> for that. <clears throat> and it's going, to be some, it's going to cause some really serious problems. So if we look at 35 million, 70 plus million, if we don't do anything with the cigarette <clears throat> tax, we could be looking at $110 million of additional cuts as a result of, um, <clears throat> of some gimmicks. And because of these gimmicks, we're going to suffer. I may not suffer. I have a good pension. A lot of other people may not suffer. But the average hardworking <clears throat> New Hampshire citizen is going to suffer. The elderly who have worked all their lives and have retired are going to suffer. Um, part of the suffering is a lot of people can't even get doctors anymore. Plain and simple, the hospitals are going saying we can't afford to constantly take Medicaid patients. And people go, well, they have to take you. No. Read the, read the fine print. If you show up in an emergency room, they have to treat you. And yes, showing up in the emergency room is one of the most inefficient ways of, being, of providing health care. If your child has, <clears throat> has the flu and is getting dehydrated, yes, it would be great to be able to get on the phone, call the nurse's office. The nurse says, come in, let me check the child and they get the child taken care of, maybe get him on antibiotics, get him on some fluids so the child's better in a couple of days. But if the child, if the mother or the father, parents can't get a doctor, can't afford health care, they show up in the emergency room, normally the child is much worse off. It's going to cost a heck of a lot more. The emergency room, the hospital is going to, are going to give a heck of a lot more tests, one, to cover their butt so they don't get sued, but also, let's be realistic, they're a business, they have to make money to stay in business, so they may have some bean counter go and say, 
I'm only going to get paid so much, but this is going to cost. So maybe if we give this test, this test, this test, this test, we will co recover enough from each one of these tests so we can at least possibly break even or not lose our shirt on this, this case. And it goes on and on and on. So again, some decisions. So when you go and look at it, those are just some of those decisions that are going to have a financial impact on the quality of life of the citizens of New Hampshire in the upcoming year. And we have to do something about it. We just have to do something about it. And I think we're going to have to do more than just stand on the corner and saying, well, we're part of the 99, okay? Or we don't like this, we don't like that. Nope. Maybe you're going to have to be, we're going to have, to, as citizens, are going to have to be more proactive. We're going to have to hold everybody accountable. Ask them why. Look me in the face and tell me what you're going to do. And if you're not going to do it, tell me why. Because there'll be certain times where we can't do it. We can't afford it. We, and say, I can't do it. This is why we can't do it. And I understand the cost of not doing it. And so that's, what, that's one of the things we're going to have to look on as um, we go into 2012. Me, I'm glad I'm living in Keene. Keene's a beautiful place. The, the Y is now open, and um, I'll be using the Y for the first time tomorrow morning. Um, I probably added maybe 15 pounds on in 2011, and I would, my goal, like everyone else is, most of people, is get rid of those 15 pounds and a few extras, and I think um, the new Y will be a perfect place to do it. Like some, I'm not exactly happy it's it's out in West Keene. I really enjoyed the ability to walk to it downtown and stop at some stores going back and forth. But, you know, hey, got to get in shape. You got to do what's available. And the Y is a really good place. And so hopefully I'll see a bunch of you out there in, in the new Y. Okay. So let's talk about some of the new issues that are, are coming up again in 2012. And um, look... <clears throat> Looking over one that's going to have a really big um, effect on us, it says, end the ethanol scam now. It goes, the federal government spent some $6 billion annually on various programs to promote ethanol use. Thanks to this financial assistance, one-sixth of the world's corn supply, just think, 17, almost 17 to 20 percent of the world's corn, all the corn supply, enough to feed 350 million people for a year, gets pumped into American cars. Who would ever thought that we'd be spending um, all that, putting all that corn into our, our cars? We've been here before. In 2007 and 2008, when a swift increase in biofuel production caused fuel shortages and shop price increases. Now we know that biofuels don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Chopping down forests is to plant corn actually raises them. No wonder it's becoming impossible to find a single environmentalist who favors corn-based biofuel. Even Al Gore now admits that his advocacy was a mistake brought on by his eagerness to court farmers' votes in Iowa. Promoting ethanol is a knee-jerk green policy that, like many others, serve only a self-interest group of businesses, not the planet. The needless hunger of millions ought to be reason enough to, to stop. And again, that goes into the politics. Vice President Gore, when he was running for um, the, the Democratic nomination, supported um, corn-based ethanol. Well, corn-based ethanol um, caused our food to go up. Anybody, has to go, anybody who's been going to the store over the past year, year and a half, just has to look at the price of um, bacon, meat, bread, some other products. And got another article. <clears throat> it goes... Corn is delivered by the truckload to ethanol plants like this one owned by Otter Daniel Midland in Decatur, Illinois. American corn farmers have been benefited from annual federal subsidies of about $6 billion in recent years, all in the name of ethanol used as an additive for the nation's um, <clears throat> vehicles. Yes, it's going to end on January 1st, but believe it or not, for every, gas, uh, for every gallon of ethanol produced, 
Arthur Midland and Arthur Daniels Midland and other ones got a 46 cent per gallon um, tax break from the government. Thanks, and but now the in industry doesn't care too much at all about the um, the 46 cents because they say, hey, we're making our money thanks to the high oil prices that make ethanol competitive. So here it is. They got the 46 cents because to make more ethanol, ethanol was supposed to help make us energy deficient, efficient, green um, <clears throat> energy, reduce um, a carbon footprint, and able to compete against the higher oil prices. So we as a nation basically spent about $30 billion in subsidies for the ethanol industry, and now ethanol says, hey, it's no big deal. The oil prices are so high, we're competitive. And so we have to ask, what did the American people get for $30 um, billion? Well, here it is. Ethanol output and exports. The United States is now, we've been using the tax credit of 46 cents per gallon to produce ethanol, taking corn from the, the American, off the American food table and making ethanol. And what we've been doing is we've been now exporting that ex, um, ethanol overseas. Um, wait a minute, I, I, we, did something go wrong here? What, is this the free market or is this the government getting involved? And it says federal laws assures that ethanol's longest share of the motor fuel um, market. <clears throat> and so as we go down, now the federal government is coming up with a new type of ethanol, which was not going to be made from corn, but switch glass wood chips, but wait a minute, we're using wood chips to heat, for example, uh, middle school, and say, but now the federal government will pay um, Arthur Daniels Midland a dollar, one cent per gallon for every gallon of um, ethanol produced from wood chips. So I guess wonder what's gonna happen to the people who have wood chip and pellet stoves. I guess they're gonna be in for quite a surprise. And when you look at, right now, opponents also see corn ethanol, which takes a larger share of U.S. corn crops than cattle, hog, poultry, as a factor in driving up food prices. <clears throat> Again, when you go and look at it, when you have corn that was being grown <clears throat> and the owners were giving government subsidies to grow corn, then they end up getting a subsidy to turn that corn into ethanol. Then what happens is there's less corn for food and bread and baked products and less corn for cattle, hogs, and poultry. So those prices go through the roof. Somehow, I don't think the American people made out on um, this deal. But there's a newer long-term battle brewing over corn-based ethanol. A 2005 law required that 7.5 billion gallons of renewable fuel be produced by 2012, this year. 6.25 were produced in 2011. And so basically, two point, the American, America, by law, we're required to come up with another 1.25 billion gallons of additional ethanol production in 2012. So again, the American people are in a situation. The law requires us as a nation to produce 7.5 billion gallons of ethanol. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to take billions of, millions of bushels out of the food system so we can follow a law that requires um, the government, requires the people to produce ethanol. Or what they're going to do is say, you know what, we're not going to use corn, we'll use wood chips. So if they come up with 1.25 billion more gallons of ethanol by using wood chips, not only would they be following the law, but they would be getting a tax credit up to $1.01 per gallon. Oh, the American people haven't won out in um, this deal. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> On, um, November, on Monday, November 26, 2011, in the environmental um, section of the King Sentinel, it has land and cold cash. 
following the money. Our high crop price is a threat to nature. In here, <clears throat> can't pronounce the guy's name, but like thousands of other Minnesota farmers, it's looking, is looking a painful decision square in the eye. Cleaner water or the irresistible temptation of corn at stratospheric prices of six to eight dollars a bushel. Next fall, 50 acres of native grassland idled under the Federal Conservation Reserve Program, CRP, will, be, will go under plow, renting it out or planting corn, who will pay him much more than the government pays him to keep it grass. It, I don't necessarily need the money <clears throat> who farms 240 acres, but my personality is such that I'm not going to leave it in CRP if I'm losing $200 per acre. Experts say 2012 is likely to be a tipping point for conservation across the upper Midwest. Some 300,000 acres in Minnesota, one-fifth of the land not, now set aside under the CRP, will be up for grabs as federal contracts come up for a renewal. In the following years, millions more acres in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, critical prairie and wetland habitat for a fourth of the nation's migration birds may also fall to the plow as farmers chew between leaving it to nature or converting it to cash crops. Many predict that nature will be the loser. And <clears throat> so to me, this is part of what goes on and where we, we sometimes fail in um, reporting or we, we fail in, in, in government. I take the Keen Sentinel article, let me see if I get it for the camera, they did a great job, explains a, a, a lot of stuff that was going on, very detailed, high crops, prices print, temp farmers from conservation. Since the drawdown creep in conservative land has already begun, since 2007, the number of acres in CRP has declined to almost 1.5 million in the, uh, Minnesota. That is partly because farmers choose to do something else with their land and partly because of changes in the program. <clears throat> so by itself, it's a really good article. But then when you go and combine it with the article that was in, on Slate.com, End of the Ethanol Scam, and you look at 2007 to 2009 dates, then you go in and you look at this one but <clears throat> article just recently, AP, and it was on msnbc.com, and it goes and says how in 2012 we have to go from 6.25 billion gallons to 7.5 billion gallons, is um, <clears throat> then all of a sudden you get a much more um, complete picture of, of what's going on. Um, I guess that's how I irritate some people at time, but, but that's the military way, the Marine Corps way that I was taught. Just don't take one article, you put them all together. There's truth in every lie, and there's truth everywhere. And the idea is to put them all together and see how they um, connect. And when you go and see how it connects, it goes in the ethanol industry, based on the fact that we want to be energy self-sufficient, that we want to be greener has come on and given us, the American people, what they want. We're producing more ethanol, which, but when you look at all the other stuff, you go far down the, the line, ethanol produces more pollution than corn does and even gas, gasoline does, but we as Americans don't look at the whole picture. Ethanol is causing the price of our food to go through the roof, and since we don't always count food in and um, energy in the CPI, people on fixed incomes don't get very much um, increase. Yeah, you get a CPI increase of 3.6 this year, but none the last two years. And you go and research, it always seems that right before the election, we get a pretty good um, increase. And right after the election, there's little to none. But in the end, when we look at it, <clears throat> we're going to America is the breadbasket of the world. And what we're doing right now is we're possibility are going to sell out our ability to be breadbasket of the world for ethanol. We're going to produce ethanol. We as the taxpayers are going to be spending a lot of money to support ethanol. 
which some people say only get about 80% of what a gallon of gasoline gets. And in the meantime, we're going we're gonna to have more polluted water. We're going to have less places for wildlife, less places for birds, less wetlands. And we're going to say <clears throat> we're helping out the American people. We're becoming a greener economy. We're coming uh, more energy efficient. If we're coming more energy efficient, I know I'm going to repeat it here, if we pay billions of dollars in farm subsidies to grow products, and then we go in and spend billions of dollars to turn that food stuff into ethanol, and now we're turning around and we passed a law saying we can then take that ethanol that we as the taxpayers paid at least twice for and send, sell it overseas while we have a law I mean, that says we, can, we will limit the amount of ethanol that we can import from places like um, Brazil, who makes ethanol not out of food stuff, but out of wasted um, <clears throat> sugar cane. To me, I'm not a, a tree hugger. Um, <clears throat> I believe in doing the right things, but this has nothing to do with um, environmental, the environment. This is about making a lot of money at the expense of the American people. Again, one of the other recent articles that were coming up, we were told that America is now exporting gasoline overseas. Wait a minute again. They're saying gasoline, American manufacturing refineries are exporting gasoline overseas because they can't sell enough gasoline in the United States. And they go and they say, well, we gotta, we got to drill, drill, drill so we can produce more oil, so we can produce gasoline and we can make the United States energy efficient and so then we can reduce the cost of oil. Well, anybody who wants to, to buy that, I would tell them, take a trip to England. England's North Sea oil production, okay? The United States doesn't set the, ba the price of oil. Great Britain doesn't set the price of oil. OPEC doesn't set the price oil, Iran, Russia. The oil is set on the open market. And in capitalism and in free trade, there is no such thing as patriotism. If I produce a billion barrels of oil, a million barrels of oil a day in the United States, and the best price I can get for it in the United States is $90, and Germany will pay me $130 a barrel, I, as a, fiduciary, as a CEO, it's my fiduciary responsibility to maximize the profit for my company. So I will then ship that million barrels of American oil to Germany to get the greatest profit and increase sheer value. That's how it works. And so <clears throat> I would, like I said, I would recommend that people go in, look at the ethanol. This is one of the topics of 2012 because this ethanol is going to have a big impact on all of our pocketbooks, how much we're going to pay for food, what quality of food we're going to have, and there's a pretty good chance that a lot less people will have a lot less meat to eat in 2012 as we, the Americans, produce more ethanol to be sold overseas at a higher price for um, prof American profit. I believe in the um, capitalist system. I believe in the free market system. But free means free. If we want ethanol to be sold, let the ethanol company stand on their own. They don't need American taxes to help them produce a product that they're going to sell overseas at our expense. So basically, oh, time's up. I was a little short because we were late today. But basically, just going to say is, I've been out there on the long road. I saw middle America, and I think we need to, to smarten up. We need to start asking questions. And so, again, I'll see you out there on the long road, and we're going to make 2012 a very interesting um, year, and we're going to try to learn as much as we can. So, again, thank you.